I'd like to now hand over to Guy Lloyd, Director and Founding Fellow of the Institute of Sales Professionals, who you might have saw in an earlier webinar, who talked to us about reducing the cost of sales. Hi there, Guy. Nice to see you again. Hi, Nikki. Thank you. It's lovely to be here again in this lovely, cold, fresh morning. <laughs> Isn't it just? Well, it's definitely going to help us sharpen our negotiation skills. That's so sure. um, I'll hand over to you, Guy. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. And I'm, I'm really delighted to support the Cost of Trading webinar series from, from UMI. Um, the ISP, for those who are not familiar with us, we were set up um, several years ago to basically advance and promote excellence in sales. We work closely with government. Uh, to help them understand uh, the importance of, of professional selling to business and the economy and uh, to define standards and certifications so that people can get recognized qualifications in this subject. Um, when Umi came to us uh, asking about negotiations, we looked into our, our, our members and um, SBR had, uh, have done a tremendous job in delivering a webinar to our members. We've got about 6,000 or so. Uh, on negotiation, so they were a natural person uh, to come to. So I've, I've asked Stuart Lotherington, MD of SBR Consulting, to provide you his insights into negotiation. He's got over 30 years of sales and negotiations, and the, the insights he's going to share with you are really for people relatively new to uh, the concept of negotiation, but also a tremendous refresher for those who have um, gone through negotiations and maybe need to sharpen their skills, particularly with all the pressures that your customers are under. And I'm sure they are going to be pushing back on any uh, needs you, you have to increase price, for example. So um, without further ado, um, let me introduce you to Stuart and um, his valuable insights and lessons that he's going to share with us all. Stuart. Thank you, Guy. And thank you, Nikki. And thanks for inviting me along to sort of share some of these insights. Um, looking forward to some of the questions you might have to come up from um, any of the things I've shared with you just for ad added clarity or further insight obviously I'm not too sure exactly where you are in your negotiation skills but let's um, let's take a look of um, around how we can go and get better at sharpening those skills obviously with the cost of living crisis and all the challenges you have we've had an awful lot of our clients now that have asked us to help them in and around that one of the things that's come up an awful lot in fact we're um, also help the uh, cardboard manufacturers. In fact, we're the go-to resource for cardboard manufacturers, apparently. And um, they've actually had to price, increase their prices considerably even before the cost of living crisis. As you can imagine, in the pandemic, cardboard became a rarity, prices shot up. And in fact, some of the suppliers there had to change their prices anywhere between five to 10 times in the space of a year. So. Um, it's something that we're very familiar with. So let me just sort of share a few things with you. Um, as Guy mentioned, my name is Stuart Lotherington, I'm Managing Director of SBR Consulting. We're basically a performance consulting com a company with around um, to help improve sales and revenue generation within firms, all the way from small businesses up to large businesses. So we've been doing this for quite some time, 20 years in fact as a business, and I've been doing it for about 30 years. But one of the things I'd like to share with you before we go and dive into this is um, what we refer to as our habits triangle. So while we're looking at how do we improve our performance in anything that we go and do, we could break it down into three constituent parts. The first part is the skills, which I'm going to be sharing with you some of the skills when it comes to negotiation. But the unusual thing about negotiation is that it's also part of a process or a system, and there is a way to be able to do it as well. So there's a skills component and there is definitely a system component towards it. But one of the things that's often overlooked in negotiation, and we won't be diving into it too much, but it's also the mindset. You know, what mindset do you have towards negotiation? So I'll touch upon that lightly. And then the idea is we practice this all the time so it becomes habit forming. And it takes, well, we, if we use Maxwell Maltz as a psychologist, his understanding is it takes 21 days to form a habit. So it's not something that we do all the time. Invariably, we need to dust up on those kind of rusty old negotiation skills. So let's jump into that. And I've got a few areas I'm going to go through is what is the definition of actual negotiation? What are the key principles? And then obviously um, we want to go, what do we do before the negotiation? Then how do we start our negotiation? So those are the subject matters that we're going to be talking about. So let's just think about what negotiation is. Now there's a clear definition in um, the Oxford Dictionary. It's a, dis a discussion set up or intended to produce settlement. Now, that is very nice, but we do feel it's slightly reductionist in its view. So we've come up in our own definition, which actually encompasses a little bit more about the relationship and coming to an agreement 
by working out problems or concerns whilst keeping each party's interest in sight. This is assuming obviously both and everyone wants to do work together. And that's a key part to this is that it has to be a desire that they um, both want an outcome, a successful outcome. Now, with that in mind, um, we want to think around where is our headspace and how do we learn about it? And we use these sort of four stages of com competency. The first one is unconscious incompetence. We don't know what we don't know. And then the second stage is then conscious incompetency. We're aware that we don't know. So could that be you with regards to your negotiation skills? And then the third stage is then conscious competency. And we're now actively employing these new skills or new ideas or new thoughts. Um, but it does take an awful lot of cognitive power to be able to make sure that we could put those into practice. And we know that when people are, are designing or doing something, they might sound a little bit plastic when they're doing it. And also, you might feel a little bit false in doing it because it doesn't feel natural. And that natural stage is when it becomes unconscious competency. Now, for those that are tenured around negotiation, the challenge of unconscious competency is, if you think about it from a context of maybe driving as an analogy, We've all learned to drive, or most of us, I'm sure, um, are drivers. But when it comes to the situation now that we may also be picking up bad habits in our driving. I only say that with regards to driving because I've been on a driver awareness course. In fact, I've been on three driver awareness courses, I hasten to admit. Um, but ultimately, we do pick up bad habits. And so without realizing it, we think we're in unconscious competency. But in reality, if we have got so many bad habits, we're in, um, in unconscious incompetency. So that gives you an idea of maybe where your headspace could be. And so that's um, to encourage you to sort of think about this process as we slowly go through the stages of negotiation. But first of all, why do people struggle to negotiate? Well, there's sort of three areas, really. One of them is that you're just worried about being humiliated. And the fact is that people might go in there and come up with a point, and then you just feel that you have to back down because you want to maintain the relationship. And so there's this second point of an avoidance of conflict. And how do you deal with that avoidance of conflict? You've got to keep your customer happy or the vendor happy. And then they've also got to make sure that you continue to do your trade. And then of course, is this lack of legitimacy, as in, do I have an authority to go and do it? Now, with the cost of trading crisis, of course, we all have, and that's one of the good things about right now, I know you can hardly say it's good, but the reality is that everybody is aware of increased prices. So it's not just something that's specific to your industry as it was with the cardboard industry that might have been out of sync with the rest and everybody else. So there is already an awareness here, but often people feel that there isn't a, a legitimacy in it and therefore you should be swallowing the cost. It's not their problem. And that's where you could be ending up mentally backing down and not doing as well as you could be in negotiation environments. So. Who are the best negotiators in the world? I would like to ponder that for a second. Who are the best negotiators in the world? Now, in reality, it should be probably people that do procurement. And there's an awful lot of organizations out there that specialize in procurement. In fact, we have a number of organizations that are clients of ours in that procurement space and are growing very well. As you can imagine, in a crisis, they end up doing very well indeed. But the best ones in the world are these little things that are running around our houses. And I'm sure if you're a parent listening to this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I'm lucky enough, I have uh, four daughters, I've got spare ones, and they have been amazing when it comes to the negotiation skills. Now, why am I sharing this? Well, fundamentally, it's a potential for it to be an innateness that we have. We have this ability to negotiate. If it isn't innate, it's certainly learned at a very early age. And sometimes we need to recognize why is it that we've lost that ability to effectively negotiate. Now, in reality, there are certain things that little children will know about their negotiation at an unconscious level. First of all, you're not going to go away. You're going to definitely look after them and you love them. And they'll take advantage of that relationship they have to be able to achieve their own way. The other thing is, of course, is that we might under pressure give you know, a concession to our children under the duress that they might have put us on, under or just from the environment we're in. All of these are interesting and important com component parts as to how do you make sure you're in a strong position to be able to negotiate. So let's think about the different negotiation styles we have. 
Now, the obvious one is that you, what we're hoping for is a collaborative win-win when we're both successful in negotiation and both parties are reasonably happy with the outcome. But of course, there is also the competitive one. I win, you lose. I've dominated that scenario. Now, that might feel for a short-term gain something that you might like to go for. But if you go into the mindset of a win-lose negotiation, there's a very good chance that relationships are going to be broken and there'll be challenges and issues with regards to that. I know recently a friend of mine has um, was changed a, a better offer on his mobile phone, for example, but the experience was so poor that he will never ever use this particular operator ever again from that bad experience. So while the operator might have been successful in their win at the start, of course, they've lost a long-term client. And of course, there is the other one, of course, with the fact that we lose and the other person wins. So those are the three obvious ones. I suppose you could also say there's a lose-lose scenario, but that's when you walk away and you've not got anything and they haven't got anything as well. But these are the three component parts you want to be thinking about. Are you going in with the right mindset of a win-win scenario? Now, this is actually straight out of some of these principles are straight out of a book by Stephen Covey, who wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, despite the fact that he passed in 2012, his book is still in the Amazon top bestseller of personal development. And it's not a sales book. It's not a business book, but it is a book about yourself and relationships you have with other people. There's some very good insights there. And I'll highlight some more of those shortly. So what happens and what do we need to do before the negotiation? So it might be helpful to think about an up and coming negotiation scenario that you've got or a client engagement that you've got coming up. Um, in, the, in the meantime, and think about how do you currently prepare for that negotiation? Well, there are certain things that you need to be, bear in mind that will help again with the mental strength and the resilience to effective negotiation. The first one is that you want to be, if you're in, in sales per se, you want to make sure you've got a full pipeline or a large number of clients ready to be able to buy your office, um, you know, your services um, or products. Now, if you don't have that, then the person that you're going to be negotiating with is likely to smell the fear or desperation. And so that's why it's important from, again, from a mental toughness point of view, make sure you've got plenty of things in your pipeline. The other one that's missed by so many people is the clarity of their need. And without that clarity of their need, you are starting from a very poor position. And what that actually ends up doing is you end up negotiating purely on price. And this is the biggest part of negotiation. And one of the biggest requests we get from our clients is it seems to be all about price. Now, we work with thousands of salespeople and literally the biggest issue they come up and tell us is we are the most expensive or we're one of the most challenging when it comes to the, our product or offering because it is so comprehensive. And therefore, they feel that there is always down to price and if only it was cheaper. But then if you do go cheaper, you're in a spiral, a downward spiral, a race to the bottom, as it's often referred to. So it's important to establish the needs. So I'm going to give you some insights on how to be able to do that possibly a little bit more effectively. So a couple of key principles here for you to start off with. All right, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. All right, perfect preparation prevents poor performance. I know some of you may have seen a more ruder version of those several Ps, but this is the polite one I'm going to share with you today. So, perfect preparation prevent uh, uh, perfect preparation um, prevents poor performance. And then the other one, just to reiterate again, qualification drives negotiation. So, knowledge is king. Knowledge is the basis of your influence, and so it's important you acquire and understand exactly what their need of that client is, which is other than price. So let's have a, a look and dive into some of the other kind of key objectives and alternatives that you might have to work with. So there is a knowledge aim, okay? You need to close the gap between what we should know and what we actually know. Now that is implicit to the fact that you need to be asking more questions and get some more clarity with your clients rather than jumping straight into a priced negotiation environment. Have you got clarity of what it is that they need? And have you also got clarity of what they've gained if they're an ongoing client of yours? Have they got some clarity or have you got some clarity of what they valued from you in your ongoing relationship with you? And are you sharing that? 
And then there's the action aim. So knowledge aim first, action aim second. What do we ideally want to happen as a result of this meeting? Have we got some clear outcomes as what we want to have from, the, um, from, our, from our meeting? Okay. Now I'm going to introduce you to some acronyms and some letters along the way. The first one here is P, M and H. Now that's the SBR version of what is referred to if you went to on the Harvard negotiation course, which is called ZOPA, and I'll explain both of those. So PMH is pride, medium, and high. The pride is the minimum level that you're prepared to go to. What is that and have that clarity in your head? Then the high is what's the maximum you're prepared to go to. And then obviously the medium is that somewhere in between that seems to be an okay benchmark. So pride, medium, and high. So the ZOPA, uh, straight, as I say, from the Harvard Business School, is the zone of potential agreement. So you and the person you're negotiating with will have a range that they would accept. And that's what we need to have some clarity on. So if we go through that and look at that zone of potential agreement, we then come up with another acronym called BATNA. And I'll explain that in a, in a second. So fundamentally, if you think about the buyer, and you look at that top line, you want to be, they want to be at the lowest price range if it's going to be then finally down to the price, okay? So they want it, the, the best desirable outcome is be at the lowest side on that left-hand side. And then obviously as the supplier, you want it to be the highest right price range to drive your profitability within your business. What you can see there, as long as there's an overlap of some description here, then you get what's called the ZOPA and you can get that more clearly as, it, as we defined here. Now, the BATNA is, is the terminology is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So what is your best alternative? If this doesn't work, what would be your scenario? Would you be prepared to walk away or do you need to have it and make sure this deal gets done? And so that's what the BATNA um, mindset or acronym is, is about. So I'm just going to hand over to Rory. He's going to just share with you an example of this, again, to our best negotiators from a movie. Brilliant. Well, hopefully you get a better idea of what was going on there and an idea of one certain variables that were brought into the negotiation. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. But how do we find out what our client wants and how do we make sure we've got a better idea to be in a better negotiation position? Now, there are a load of qualification frameworks out there. Some of you might have heard of Medic or MedPick, Scotsman, Bant. I'm going to introduce you to the one that we use in SBR Consulting to give you an idea of qualifying your prospect or your client when it comes to quality, um, negotiation. Now, first of all, and the number one, that hopefully the themes come across the entire way, is the need. What is the actual need and have you got clarity of the issue of all the consequence and the value? So what's the issue that your product or service is, is sorting out? What's the consequence if they don't use your services? And what's the value that you bring to the table? Have you got absolute clarity around that and ask questions around that side? When do they need it? Clarity around the timelines. And then of course, who's going to be in the person that's going to be signing this off? So that's what we refer to as um, the authority. So what is the process of making that this, this purchase decision? Who's involved? And then what is their um, buying criteria? If you ascertain those things, you'll be in a much better negotiation position. Because the, one of the questions I often get asked is, you know, how do I know that I'm not in the process of just being um, benchmarked against existing suppliers and things like that? If you've gone through this Entabo methodology, then you'll have a much better feel for whether that is the case or not. And someone's just trying to drive down prices against somebody else. Finally, then, have they got some clarity around budget? But if they don't have clarity around budget, how is this being funded, particularly in a new business environment? And it's a new expenditure for them in the business. And then the one pit that's often missed in most other uh, qualification frameworks is what we refer to as obstacles. So what is going on that might prevent this from taking place? Is there something that they're going to be merging with another organization? Are they closing down particular parts of their organization? Are they merging with others? All of these things would be good to clarify and get some greater understanding so that we know 
um, where our position is. Now, you can score these. You could see a scoring system down the bottom to give you an idea of how successful you're likely to be. Now, zero obviously is you don't know. One is that you, you think you know. Two is you definitely know. And then the third one is being validated by the client or the person you're negotiating with at some stage during the process. So moving on from that side, what do we do with other key in principles? Well, first of all, price sensitivity reduces with desire. This is the reason why we need to have clarity around their needs. So for example, it says here, right? A dream is a bargain no matter what you pay for it. If someone has a very desire and a great desire for something, price becomes less important. I'll give you an example of that. As I mentioned, I've got four daughters. The word Louboutin comes up regularly in conversations around um, a shoe and top end shoe manufacturer. Now, there's no way that we're going to be going out there and buying a cost of a Louboutin. But if that Louboutin was reduced slightly in, pri in price, we'd end up paying way more than we normally would do for um, shoes because of that desire to have it so much. Now, the other key part here is make a stand before giving any concessions. One of the invites and um, things I see so much in examples of role plays when it comes to negotiation is people start giving away things before you've got some clarity as to exactly what it is that you're um, offering. So make a stand before you give any concessions. Now, if it then becomes a price scenario, then what you should be looking at is not giving anything away always trade. So if you're offering a service that's got a number of um, component parts to it and somebody wants a reduction, then take one of those component parts relative to the price they're looking for to reduce it so that you're trading the entire time, maintaining the value of your offering. That really gives you insight as to why splitting the difference is not negotiation. So many of us have thought that that's the way we negotiate is that that's your price. That's my price. Let's go halfway through. You're not effectively negotiating if you're doing the split the difference approach to your negotiation. And here's the thing that we often see as well. You've made a price, you've put a stand in and then you start negotiating with yourself. I'll give you an example of this. We recently had to be living in the, near the woods. We had to recently have our roof cleaned. Now, we actually got three vendors to come around to offer that service. Now, what's amazing is that they all came in with quite a wide range of pricing. Now, we weren't too sure which one to go for, but out of those three vendors, there was only one vendor that came back. And that one vendor that came back was the one that we said yes to. Now, as it happens, he was the cheapest, but he was the only one that made the effort to come back. And that was the reason why we thought he obviously wants to do the work. And because he was the cheapest, it made the decision much easier. But the point being is that you don't need to negotiate with yourself. He had actually reduced his price um, because he negotiated with himself from being the cheapest to even cheaper. So the point being here is that you start negotiating with yourself and you start reducing prices and you shouldn't need to do so or you need to get the clarity before you start doing that. So let's think around before we enter into a negotiation. Know your goals, right? What's your pride, medium and high? Not just in the price, but in the in overall package of what you're offering. OK, make a list of those things that you want from your negotiation. What variables are you going to introduce the negotiation? So I'll get some, give you some more clarity of variables in a minute. How important is a continued co um, cooperation with the uh, relationship with the individual you're talking about? You know, how long or how important is it for you to maintain this relationship going further forward? And what's the other party's ideal outcome? Again, we need to get that clarity. We haven't already done so before negotiation starts. And what might they be prepared to accept? And then finally, what are your options? You know, what is the bottom line? So one of your batners could be complete withdrawal and you walk away um, from the situation. You might accept it with protest or you might accept it without protest um, are the kind of areas that you could be thinking about. So when we're talking about these different parts, let's go through the component parts. So some of you may be familiar with this. If you want something good, cheap and fast, it's in your dreams and you're allowed to pick two. So it's cheap and good, but it's not going to be fast or it's fast and good, but it's not going to be cheap or it's cheap and fast, but it's not going to be good. I think I might have said that twice. 
I, I understand again from the girls that they actually had the same thing when it comes to looking for a potential suitor as a partner. Um, one of my daughters turned around and said, I'm looking for somebody that's uh, good looking, available and wealthy. And, I've t and I shared her this saying that's actually maybe she'll be two out of those three things. But how do we apply that to what we're working with in our environment? Well, let's think about variables. So there is the constant that we have, and then there's the variable. The variable basically is going to be things that can move that's other than the price. And then the constant is the thing or the service that somebody actually wants. Let me just give you an example of that. Let's imagine you want to get to New York. Well, one variable is the transportation you take. Do you fly? Do you go by boat? Or if you're really extreme, do you row? Now, in reality, I would imagine most of us would consider flying. But even in, when we fly, the constant is that we want to get to New York. The variable could be the time we want to go, what seat we want to sit in, or what class of seat we want to sit in. And even then, there's more variables as to whether we go direct or we go indirect. And then another variable could be you know, how we pay. Would that be on in, installments, on a credit card, or direct, direct debit, or something like that? So what we've got is a huge amount of variables that we probably don't recognize that we can use to negotiate with and then ascertaining what the constant is. Now, the other thing to consider that you might have access to is what we refer to as a covert. Now, a covert is something that in most cases might not be particularly expensive for you, but might be high value for the other person. I know, for example, Virgin Airlines, as a covert, they've offered you know, a driver limousine service if you get a certain category of car, which would be potentially for the price that they're talking about, a low entry point for them, but a high perceived value for somebody using that service. You might then go on there in the negotiations and think, look, I'll tell you what, I'll also throw this in. If you decide to go this, I'll also throw this in. And then somebody goes, wow, that's an obvious bargain. And so it's recognizing, do you have any coverts that you could possibly use or hold back? Or are you giving them away without realizing they could be useful in negotiation? So as I said earlier, are you thinking about this in perspective of an up and coming meeting? So we've got our preparation and we're going to think about our constants, coverts and, and, and our variables to be able to better prepare ourselves for negotiation. And so just think about these final things, right? Remember, qualification drives negotiation. What are the insights you have? And what's the objectives and alternatives you could have um, with regards to negotiation? I've already alluded to the mindset. Are you in the right place? This is where children know how to take advantage of that. And you know what would be your kit list of things that you could negotiate with? So let's go into the negotiation itself. You know, how do we actually approach a meeting when we're going to go into negotiate. Well, there's an acronym we use is a sales methodology. And there's plenty of sales or communication methodologies out there. The one that we have is QUIS, and it simply stands for question, understand, influence, and solidify. Now, in a lot of sales environments, quite often we go into influence first. And what we're saying and advocating, as does all sales communication methodologies, is understand your prospect or client first, which is why the Q and the U is all about them. The second part is then influence, and that's all about us, and then solidifies the closing or clarifying the next steps in that final part. So there's these three stages, them, us, and we, when it comes to effective communication. Now, when we're going to approach it, if we look at that graphically, we're in this current state and we want to negotiate. So we have a scenario where somebody wants to achieve a, a better performance in their organization or use your um, service offering or products. And hopefully they're going to be in a better position with that. And so your focus is achieving that performance. Now, the client at the moment in their current state is um, lower down on that performance, which is why they want to use your services. And you'll just then go and pitch for your services. Now, in a lot of cases, I don't think any of you are probably just going into pitch but you might go back a little bit and find out about what their needs are and then pitch. What we're advocating is you go back a little bit further and this is where the Q and the U comes in and makes sure that we can go back to go forward. Now, what that looks like is if you go back to go forward and get some greater insight of their needs, their issues, 
the consequences of that and the value they're going to gain from using your your service or products then you have a chance of actually getting better pricing out of this situation because they can see the value over the com competition now we take this and that's what we refer to as the value gap. And we take this again, another one of Stephen Covey's seven habits is seek first to understand and then be understood. So qualification again is key. And when you go into these meetings, you want to set the scene and you set the scene as to what you're intending to go and do. Thanks very much for your time. Appreciate you taking the time. Set aside an hour for today's meeting for us to discuss this. Okay, um, I'm hoping that we can find a, such a solution um, that we both agree going further forward. Um, the agenda is to understand a little bit more about your situation, what it is that you're aiming for. Then I can share where we're coming from and hopefully we um, can agree on the next steps at the end. Is that okay as an agenda? Is there anything else you want to add? And then you go, well, as I said earlier, if we do get an agreement, hopefully at the end of today, you'll be able to make a decision and we can move further forward. And then you open up and you can see there the acronym QQQA. Now that's our acronym for a cluster question. It's question, 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 and anything else. I'll give you an example of that. So the last time we, here, here, starting here. So the last time we spoke, I suggested that, um, you know, there was these issues and these issues that you talked about that were coming up here. Well, from our perspective, I'll be really keen to understand a little bit more about this particular issue you referenced some of the things that seem to be going well for you and some of the areas that you feel that are issues or challenges you'd like to bring forward or is there anything else you'd like to bring up in today um, in today's meeting so it's a question question and then anything else so to start and open up the meeting and to pass the talking baton as we say to the individual to start them talking the more you get them to talk the more you'll get some understanding as to where they want to focus and what they want to go and do but that's not the only type of questioning you could use. So the QQQA is what we refer to as a cluster question. It's several questions in one sentence. Now, some of you may say, well, that's confusing. But the reality is our brain works as a filter and they'll pick out a question that they're much more likely and, um, and comfortable to answer. So if you fire out a couple of questions in one sentence, they'll pick the one that's most relevant. Um, and that will start the flow of conversation rather than one question and a short answer. Then what you want to do is you want to expand that um, the, with an expanding question. So, oh, well, what else? Oh, that's really interesting. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? And you get them to talk some more. So you're going to a second level of understanding rather than that superficial first level. Then you can also use what if questions. OK, so explore solution. What if this happened? If we were to come up with this, would that sound like it's something that could be of value for you? And the language I'm using there is what we refer to as buying atmosphere language, rather than it will um, help or it, it, uh, it should or it may, is creating buying atmosphere, which is a nicer atmosphere for people to feel that they're in control rather than selling atmosphere where people feel that they're being pushed in some way. And then a check-in question. Now, I know most of you would think of a check-in question is, does that make sense? If you think and reflect on that question, what's the response pretty much 99% of the time is always yes. So it's not a very good checking question. So a much better checking question, it would be something that's going to invoke a much more of an open, um, an open answer. So I'll give you another example. Um, I'm just curious what's going through your mind with what I've shared with you so far. That doesn't warrant a yes or no answer. So therefore, people are likely to be open up and you get a better understanding of where they are. And then, of course, you can get commitment questions. And there's several ways to get commitment questions or some clarity around it all is some trial closing questions. Other than price, does everything else around what we're talking about satisfy your needs? Is there anything else we should be considering other than the price right now? So you're then zooming in and taking the price out of the picture to make sure you haven't got any issues about the rest of your service offering or product. And that's important as well to make sure that if it does then get through all those things, you know it's price, you can then start talking about your coverts, your constants and your variables um, in a negotiation scenario. So there are a load of techniques and here's, here's a couple of techniques you want to think about as a summary. Right? So always trade, never just give something away. Okay, make your suggestions condition you. If we are to go ahead, what we could do is this rather than we give you we, we will give you this okay make it conditional 
before you give things away. Okay, trade one thing at a time so that you've got some clarity as to where the value is the entire time. Obviously, you want to maximize your variables to minimize their variables. And then remember that the price and package are um, inseparable. They've got to be together as the whole package rather than just going down to price at that last part, again, to that trading. Now, we do work with a load of procurement specialists. We are familiar with a load of terms. Um, there are a load of these out there. And you may be familiar with some of these different types of techniques that people use in negotiation. I'll just pick out um, a couple of these ones. Um, but for example, the Colombo technique is just one more thing after you've already felt that you've closed out. The other one is competitive pricing. We've got a better price from somebody else. The one is, you know, if you have uh, the fade accompli, and that's the one where they just turn around. If you don't do this, we're out of here. And then the salami strategy is saying, I'll take a thousand widgets off you. You give them a price for a thousand widgets and they say, well, actually, I only need a hundred widgets, but I'll have it at your thousand widget price, i.e. they've sliced it to get the area that they want to go and do. So those are sort of things that you could be aware of um, that, that's uh, give you an understanding. And the key thing to bear in mind is when it comes to negotiation, people that are involved in negotiation, procurement specialists are trained four times longer and harder than any sales environment. So they're equipped better. So hopefully that's giving you some better understandings of the techniques they use and the techniques you could use to help get better with regards to your negotiation. Thank you all for staying on and listening. I think there may be some time for some questions. So please feel free if you haven't already done so to drop those into the chat. But Nikki, over to you. I love, uh, Stuart, the whole reminder about negotiating with yourself. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a helpful watch out and reminder because I, I would, uh, I've certainly found myself in danger of doing that sometimes. Um, so, yeah, that was great. So we've got a few questions, if we can just uh, throw them at you. Um, the first one is um, interesting. So uh, you've talked a lot. Uh, throughout around questioning and more questions and so on but when actually in the sales cycle should you start to negotiate it's a, it's, it's a great question and actually um you know there there's there's a sales cycle and there's also a buying cycle as well if i if i introduce the buying cycle first of all you know so somebody who's completely satisfied with what they've got already existingly right now you can't negotiate with somebody that's already satisfied you know when somebody approaches us and offers us something most of us will turn it down because we're completely satisfied with our current existing situation where it starts getting confusing is people then go into realization i'm aware of your product or service offering and so they're showing an initial interest and people do sometimes start negotiating well if you buy it now i can give you this price but you're just you're just in that awareness you're not actually shopping per se the next stage is when you would be looking to make a purchase and so you would be doing some research around that um, product or service offering and so that's the part when people will, will be more curious and ready to make that purchase decision once they're doing the research so that's the buying cycle part in the selling cycle of when we do our introduction and when we go through the quiz sales methodology as an example we question and understand. And so we want to make sure that we've got that clarity. And then we do our, we influence with our product and service offering. We need to ascertain exactly their needs and making sure we satisfy those needs and that our, our offering is the right offering for them before we start any negotiation. So very simply, the, the negotiation is at the end and you've got to make sure it is at the end and you're not doing it during the process. So it's a relatively simple answer. Um, but ultimately, I see a lot of people making mistakes with that. Yeah, and uh, again, I've, uh, I've I've probably fallen into the trap of that myself and tried try to close the deal too quickly. That's that's I think often a a kind of common a common uh, mistake as well. Close, close, now, close it, try to close it too quickly, and therefore you then go straight into price because they're not ready to make it, so they they can negotiate because from a position of strength without yeah. them having that clear clarified need. You're right. Yes. Exactly. Um, now, this is uh, a, lots of people I think will be really interested in the answer to this one. Is it best to be the first to state your price? 
that's probably the most common question and one that everybody wants to know. So I should have probably put it into the presentation. So apologies for not doing that. Um, when it comes to negotiation, we look at the video that was uh, that was shared in there. When who who came up with the first price? Was the person that negotiated? Was the young lady, the young girl who came in first? Now, what's really fascinating about this, and it's been proven. I work with a number of behavioural scientists, um, and what's been proven is if you come in with the first price, you then set the benchmark of people's perception. So if you're looking at something just sort of randomly and you say, how much is something like that? And they go into a figure that's way much, 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 much higher than you were anticipating. They've put in a position. Now, the challenge is if you do put in a position that's too high, then you could turn somebody completely off. So the um, it's scientifically proven that it's best to come first, but there are loads of caveats and examples where you might not. Um, coming with the first price. So it's, it's, it's not an exact science to be able to say it. But as a rule of thumb, you want to sort of benchmark your pricing first. The challenge is, is if you're not too sure what the competition is charging and where you are and what their budget is, you're at risk of being um, having them walk away if it's just too too out of their perception. Right? And, and I guess mindset. that's where it comes back to what you were saying earlier, which is, you know, your preparation, your research, in advance of even the conversation, but then throughout the conversation, questioning and saying, you know, are you thinking about anybody else? What kind of other solutions have you looked at so you can try and suss out? And exactly. you'll know research what kind of pricing they're at. The old old school thinking of in sales was ABC, and that acronym stood for always be closing. The modern right. version is ABQ, always be qualifying. And in our sales methodology, which um, should be in all sales methodologies, is qualification is not a step in the process. It's the whole throughout the entire process that you're always testing it. But the, the examples you just gave there, Nikki, were some great examples of it. Who else are you looking for? You know, what have you seen? What do you like about them? You know, how are you comparing? And one critical question to ask is if they are looking at other vendors is to ask them um, other than price, what are your key criteria for selecting the right vendor? Now, that in effect is them ask, you're asking them to tell you how to sell to them mm -hmm. and how you can negotiate with them. It's a, one question I would say everyone should write down. Is, yeah, you know, you're looking at other it. vendors. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Great reminder. Now, um, this one, I think lots of people will have uh, found themselves in the position of, and I certainly have. And it's when you think you're uh, just being really used as kind of negotiating fog fodder. And uh, because they've got an incumbent supplier and they want to drive down the price, how do yes. you spot that? Are there any sort of key indicators to that? Well, the um, so if I've understood you correctly, is uh, do you uh, are you being utilised to sort of drive down the price with another vendor or an existing supplier? Is that, that yeah, yeah. That right? Yes, absolutely. Well, you've already elicited it by the questions that you've asked when you were talking about how do you do you work that. The key thing is, is that clarification. You're never going to get it right because you can get some very shrewd people that won't give that information away. And this is the reason why, you know, if you look at Cialdini's six key influence and persuasion um, skills or principles, one of those is liking and that you like the person and hopefully you build a degree of trust with that person. And so part of it's going to be on that uh, a trust element. Part of it's going to be down to your questioning part of it is going to be actually fishing around and thinking how they respond to you. The other part to this is actually understanding you know, your personality type. Now, there are different personality types and there's different um, psychometrics behind this as well. So if I was to take one of the more common ones like DISC or Insights, you know, so those people that are kind of red driver individuals. Now, that those individuals and blue individuals that are more analytic have a tendency to hide their emotions. They're more task oriented individuals and they'll be more challenging. And they're also the sort of people that would be involved in negotiations. And um, so they're more closed. If you've got somebody who's a yellow or an expressive individual or an amiable as more people oriented um, individuals, they're more likely to give um, telltale signs when you talk to them or ask them questions. But one of the things we don't do, or sorry, one of the things a lot of people don't do is just ask and be that, that sort of say, who else you're talking to? What else you're doing this? What would you be using this? Are you using somebody existing at the moment? And we have a tendency, again, to mentally mushroom, make it bigger in our head than the reality. 
But if you're asking good qualification um, questions, you should be able to elicit, um, or you've got greater potential to elicit whether you are in this kind of playoff scenario. Because pri if, if price is all they're focusing on, there's a good chance you're just being used for price. You want to find out all the other reasons. And that's where the telltale sign is, is what is this hub solving? How is it solving? What have they done before? How successful has that been? Why are they looking elsewhere? Um, those are the questions you want to be asking to try and elicit that. Really helpful. Thanks. And then um, one last question uh, that I think we've probably got time for. Uh, can you win a negotiation but end up with a bad deal for an unhappy customer? Well, I would call that a win-lose scenario. Yeah, so of course you can win. And then the, the customer could feel that they've lost because you managed to get the price higher. Um, I, I used the cardboard example um, earlier because they had to increase prices on several occasions in some up to 10 times in a year. The scenario is that obviously the unhappy customer is that would be likely to be an unhappy customer if they're seeing that actually from something that's a, you know, quite a specific product that's readily available, if that's then they go and see it um, cheaper somewhere else. And I'm sure we've all been guilty of buying something and then round the corner seeing exactly the same product at a, at a different or a lower price and feeling upset with that experience. So I think it's important to drive the value of what you're offering and making sure that's, that's, that's established and clear for both parties. Um, but it is possible to have that win-lose without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and then you might lose, lose the customer ongoing once that contract's finished or they've taken your your product offering brilliant thank you uh listen uh we've we've got such a lot um stuart from uh from that brief session today and i'm sure people can hook up with you on uh linkedin uh if if they'd like to explore more but hopefully uh guys have gone away today with um a better understanding of uh the negotiation kind of process and and how to get the best possible deal but with some real practical um tips as well uh alongside that so thank you, thank um, you nikki well it just uh, finally i mean if people are interested on the sbr consulting website there's a whole bunch of free resources as well um that's ready to be available under the resource tab mm -hmm. there and um, by all means just pick your way through those on all sorts of things to do with sales and negotiation great stuff thank you very much so that just leaves me uh, to wrap up and uh, talk about next steps. Uh, for UMI, it's really, really important that people uh, feel that they can go away and take action as a consequence of the information or expertise that we share with you. So um, as I mentioned before, you can sign up um, for a three month free uh, access to the UMI SatNav service where you'll get tons of advice, expertise, access to finance, um, and also UMI advisors uh, who you can get access to, as I mentioned, on any particular channel, whether that's social media, via the phone, in a Teams face-to-face -face session, etc. So please make use of that. Um, you'll also get in an email follow-up uh, an action plan so that you can just, sometimes it's just a really, really good thing to do to just write down your thoughts. What, what did you take away from it and what are you going to do next about it? Because I know uh, as a chief executive of business, it gets really busy. So to have spent an hour listening to this advice and expertise, um, let's not go off track and not implement it within our businesses. So use the action plan uh, to do that. This is a series of webinars, um, which again, I'd like to thank all of our partners uh, for participating in. So please do uh, go through the SatNav service and access those webinars again, if you would find it useful or if you've missed any. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, I really, really believe as businesses that we can do much, much more if we're helping each other out. We don't have to compete. Uh, we can actually collaborate and help, help each other out. And there's been some absolutely fantastic ways in which businesses are reducing their energy costs through creative ideas around saving energy, resources, etc. It's not just all the traditional ideas. So if you do have thoughts, if you've done things in your business that have made a big difference that you're happy to share with others, then use the um, hashtag cost of trading crisis on any of our social media channels. Um, 
And lastly, as I mentioned before, please do tell us what you think. Uh, has this been useful? Uh, if if uh, What would you like to see more of if it has? Um, but equally, tell us what hasn't worked for you so we know we can improve on it next time round. So that just leaves me uh, once again to say thank you uh, so much to uh, Stuart and Guy again for joining us and giving up your time to share your experience and your expertise. Thanks, guys, and have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.